And we're going to start our second day of the leadership uh, seminar. Well, now it's getting better because now we have Britt here, so that's going to be awesome. All right, she's back. The, the day didn't start well. Now, now, now everything's fine. Brittany's here, so everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to be okay. I know that the good thing with Brittany, she likes discreet entries. She doesn't like to be noticed. That's why I'm not insisting. I'm not insisting on her being here today, but she's actually here in the second row. If people in the camera, you want to see her, that's it. Can you zoom in a bit? Are you okay? Uh, it's good to see you. Did I say that? I, okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Lord, we thank you for this, um, this new day. We ask that you would uh, just guide us in our studies and reflections on, on important topics today. And we thank you for your presence among us. And we ask you to bless our time together. Amen. All right. So uh, what I'd like to do uh, before we start a new topic today, I think we have two new topics. Of course, I'll do one, which is the, the title of the book, you know, the chapter by uh, J.C. Ryle. I think if you haven't been there yesterday, the point was... There are several warnings in one of his book, uh, books, and we chose six of those warnings, and we decided to use them as titles for our uh, sessions in the leadership seminar. So you can find those uh, warnings in the books. I think they have a copy. In, they have copies in the cafe. So yesterday we said two things. Uh, we were encouraged not to curb the word of God, and number two, uh, be careful. Be aware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So I'll, I'll go back to those two points. The first hour I spoke about that, uh, the corrupting the word. Pastor Shalom spoke about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So I'll, I'll just summarize that a little bit So for those who were not there yesterday. And today we'll talk about another warning, which is being aware of all kinds of different uh, of strange teachings that we see that in the book of Hebrews. So I'm going to say it out at the outset, I'm not going to list all the strange teachings because they would, they would just, it wouldn't be fun at all. It would take us, there are so many heresies in church history that they have to categorize them in eight different categories because they, they, it's not, you don't have five heresies. You have eight kinds of heresies and in, in, in which kind you have hundreds of them. Okay, so, so Pastor Steve could, could do church history one and two just on the heresies and he wouldn't have enough time. Um, <clears throat> okay, so what we said yesterday, the first hour was the encouragement we find in the Bible to be careful with how we handle the word, right? And the point we made basically was uh, that we do corrupt the world in ways, the word, sorry, in ways that we wouldn't suspect. I, of course, we are not going to be rejecting the inspiration of scriptures, we believe in it, but by in effect, practically, we may actually reject the inspiration of scriptures by rationalizing scriptures. You remember we said that, and the point was that maybe I'm, I'm seeing you know, the 21st century is a challenge for the biblical faith, right? It is a challenge. Now, we may want to be uh, either by pressure or we, want, we used the word relevant yesterday. We want to be relevant in the wrong way, and we may think that if I alter my answer, or the meaning of scriptures by rationalizing what it means, then I would be able to talk to people about what I believe. So even though we don't want to acknowledge the idea that we reject the inspiration of the scriptures, we may want to rationalize. Or we also said the word over-contextualize, meaning that we are going to try to say, well, Paul meant that 2,000 years ago, but he obviously wouldn't mean it today. He would obviously he would have a different mind. And by saying this, I'm putting Paul as the authority of his letters, not the Holy Spirit. Right? Because that would mean the Holy Spirit was meant something yesterday, and he means something different today. That would mean that he actually never inspired the scriptures, or that would mean that God changes. And we know that to be something contrary to scriptures. Okay, so we said those things, and we also spoke on the way we uh, keep ourselves from being tempted by those uh, rationalizing, over-contextualizing, and other um, things we said yesterday. I don't want to go into details, but we said that uh, G.C. Wright offers four different ways to, um, that we could, um, in which we could speak that would help us stay in the idea of not corrupting the word. You know, remember what this four words? Remember? 
Can, can you tell me? Sincerely, so as not, I, and sincerely, I could be sincerely wrong, but sincerely meaning I am convinced of the truth, right? So number two, being sent by God. Like we are not here, um, we are on a mission. It's Matthew 18, we said that. Number three, live before God. That's a very major theme in the Reformation. Is like, uh, as they call it in Latin, Quran Deo, I'm living before God. So I'm not a different guy, whether I'm in my house, in the church, or when I'm in the street, or, or in my work. Um, okay, so I live before God. I, I, live, I live this way. And number four? As in Christ. I, we are his ambassadors, and that's what we said yesterday. So the, the role of an ambassador is not going to uh, go to a meeting sent by the president or the country by saying, well, I know the president is an idiot. I know he has wrong ideas. I'm sorry about that. But if I had my ways, I would do this way, but I have to do this. That would be the worst ambassador ever. But if we corrupt the word, that's what we do. I know God said that, fill in the blank, but what I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to tell you is that if we would think it through, then maybe we'll go this way. And by, we actually, and what's the point we made is with 1 Corinthians, 1, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, is that if we are true to the gospel, then we have all the power we need to be relevant. Right? 1 Corinthians verse 18, and we, we went through the chapter together. So that was the point. Then Pastor Shallow spoke about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and he started in a very interesting way by defining what a profile of a Christian should be. You remember the word they use? Simplicity would be one. Humility. Pure conscience. So he went through several verses. And was inter- I think the way he presented it yesterday was very interesting because he said, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, we, we, uh, we, we can talk about what they are, but he already did yesterday, so I think it's recorded so you can watch it online as well. But <clears throat> what I liked about what he said yesterday is one of those warnings that God is asking, and we talk about simplicity today, and that is one of the main reasons why we adopt so many strange teachings, because we complicate things. You know, the, the simple elements of the gospel are thrown out the door because it's, not, it's too simple. You know? I don't know if you've ever seen people telling you, especially from other religions that are based on works, they will tell you that the way you, you speak about the gospel is way too simple. It cannot be that simple. I mean, I mean I'm just forgiven but my, because Christ died on the cross. Come on. There has to be a catch somewhere. There has to be something I've got to do to be able to. Um, so, but the point he made yesterday was that we have this profile as a Christian. We have simplicity, humility. We have a clear conscience. And then we, we're going to have two opposite. Um, I think there is 311 in the Bible, but he mentioned two yesterday. Um, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and you remember the, the, uh, the image that he put on the screen with, with the cliff with two temptations. One would be legalism, the other one would be lib- liberalism, right? So, and these are the same ideas of those strange teachings we are going to speak about. And actually, there's one strange teaching that the Bible speaks most about would be legalism because it addresses Jews that were converted, and so the Jews the Judaizers that were trying to convince the pagans that they should also follow the law. So legalism was a big issue, but legalism takes so many forms. It's not just following the law. Legalism could be, and I, when I did Theology of Grace a year and a half ago in the Bible College, I challenged the students to, 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 um, by saying, you know, we can be legalistic about grace. So we talked about that. And, you know, looking at you, that's the opposite of legalism. No, I think anything, any message you take that you unroot from the character of God can make it legalism. If I'm telling someone who's condemning himself that he shouldn't because grace is there for him, I'm actually being legalistic about grace. Your problem is not you're not giving yourself grace. That's your problem. I don't know how you feel with me pointing a finger at you, but that's the point, right? I don't know. I don't. I, I don't know if I'm. I don't know if I'm helping you by looking at you. Your problem is that you should give yourself more grace, and that's what the Bible says. And I can be emphatic about it. And all of a sudden, I'm very legalistic about grace. So. Legalism is one of the main issues, and that's why I think I really enjoyed yesterday uh, Pastor Scheller's message. All right, so today we're going to go to another one, and I'd like for you to turn with me in Hebrews chapter 13, and we're going to read verse 7, 8, and 9. And we are, as I said, discussing all kinds of strange teachings as the title, but again, we're not going to 
go through the list of those strange uh, teachings because it would be laborious, boring, and not edifying at, at all. Uh, but this is the verse that G.C. Ryle uses to in introduce his chap chapter, and I think it's a very good verse. And I, I, he uses verse 9. I'm, I did verse 7 and 8 for context, because actually some of the solution that he uh, mentions uh, that we could see um, as the problem that he raises in the verse 9s are found in, in, in 7 and 8. So all right, this is what it says here. Uh, Hebrews 13, 7, 8, and 9. Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of, of God to you, whose, whose faith you follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines or teachings, for it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. So, if I want to summarize the points I like to make, the very, very two simple points that we, uh, that we did yesterday morning. Identify the, the problem is, and number two, identify how we keep ourselves from being, falling in those, in those issues. Yesterday we spoke about corrupting the world and how we keep ourselves. And we're going to talk about strength teachings, how tempting they can be, and also how we keep ourselves from those. Uh, <clears throat> because again, I think it's funny, I don't know, it's... Um, I mean, it's true for anything, uh, but it's true for us as Christians. If I think I'm not the candidate to be tempted by strange teachings, I may be on the top of the list, you know, because when I'm sure I'm, I'm securing something, and, and that could be that I've become proud about it. And we know, as we said yesterday, uh, humility is the key, you know, not to fall into corrupting the word. Like, if I'm proud about not being corrupted, I may be the candidate for corruption in that sense. So uh, <clears throat> we will go through a few verses in the Bible that talks about the same thing, and then we'll comment them as, as we read them, okay? So we'll keep um, uh, verse 7 and 8 for later, but let's, let's look at uh, the part A of, of um, uh, uh, verse 9. Do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines. Now, if you remember the carried about, we have the same idea in Ephesians 4, 14, right? Uh, the expression tossed to and fro. So if you want to turn with me uh, into Ephesians 4, then we are going to. It's, a, it's, it's interesting because I've spoken several times on, on that chapter because I think for me it's one of the most interesting intri verse, verse, um, Verse 11 through 16, uh, we're not going to read all those because that would be a different topic. But <clears throat> in the verse four, 14 is what it says. Uh, explains that he has given, you know, and then he lists the, uh, the, uh, the gift to the church. Uh, the pastors, apostles, evangelists, pastors, doctors, you know, and, and uh, uh, prophets. And then he explains what the process of teaching will do. And then he, so he gives the positive Effects. You know, we will be edified. The church will be uh, solidified. And then he says also that's the negative aspect of this that we wouldn't be tossed to and fro. Verse 14, right? That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Now, besides the fact I think that it's obvious what he's saying, I like the way he phrases it. You know, it's like it's a complex sentence, but he's actually saying something strong. He says, like, when we toss to and fro, it's not just, oh, it's, it's fine, you're ignorant. You know, it's like, you know, there is a plan behind it. So if I think I'm not going to be moved by it, I better know that my convictions are strong and, and I'm keeping myself because the temptation, like, the, you know, Psalm 119, my soul clings to the dust. Uh, the reason why legalism is so appealing to us is because there is a part of me that could be glorified. Well, there, when you know, Pastor Shalom made uh, like three or four years ago, he did the whole series on grace versus legalism, and the basic point that he made at the beginning and, and at the end of the series was very simple: is grace puts God at the center, and legalism puts me at the center. It's very simple. So, <clears throat> the temptation of legalism is not. Because we found, oh, legalism is so hard. Yes, it is. But in the same time, the reward 
when you were legalists. It's awesome. Look at the Pharisees. They had a great life. They were the top of the food chain. They were telling other people what to do. They could compare with others. They I really put people down as much as they can so we could feel really, really good about themselves. It's actually, if you're good at being legalist, it's a good life. It's a really good life. Because, so it's very rewarding. You know, here I am on the platform. I'm way higher than you guys. Let me tell you how my life is awesome, how you could also live an awesome life. It's very simple. And then, oh, wow, he knows all that stuff. We can look at this. It's awesome. If I follow the footsteps, you know, and then, or the three steps, or the how to's, and I can, you can, over here, you can buy my books at the end, the how to's of being a good Christian. I can do a great seminar, and I'm sure it would be very appealing because you too would like to succeed. But the point is, we have victory in Christ, but that's not enough for us many times. Like, my flesh is not satisfied with the idea of having victory in Christ. I could have victory in myself. I'm a self made man, I'm a self made Christian. That could be very tempted. So, <clears throat> the point is, legalism is very appealing because it appeals to us as in our sin nature. That's the issue. So, I cannot dismiss legalism. Oh, you know, this is greater grace, church. We don't do legalism. Yes, we do. Like all, all of us do. Like legalism, this is what we do. This is a default mechanism in our Christian life. So, Pastor Shalom said one day it was very interesting. He, I don't know if you remember, it was a meeting with pastors, and he asked the question Do we preach grace and lead in, lead in legalism? I was with dead silence for a moment because, of, of course, like everybody has not to overanalyze, but that's a very good question. Like it's easy for me to preach grace and have a good message. It's also very easy for me to put some standards in there at the same time, so as we said earlier. So the strange doctrine, it's not just like, oh, it's something over there, you know, like it's something. I've read about legalism somewhere. I've never heard really about it. It's so foreign to me, I don't even think about it. No, the way he presents the way how those wind of doctrine come is very structured. Look at this, what he says. Uh, <clears throat> With every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, there's a plan, there's an agenda. It's the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of this plotting. I mean, craftiness and plotting are almost redundant. You're planning or you're crafting, but he does both. He's crafting the plotting. It's super organized. There's, there is a plan by man. There's a plan by our flesh. There's a plan by the devil. There's a plan by the world. Because I don't think we know that. We know for sure that God wants us to succeed in our Christian life, but the devil wants us to succeed in our flesh. He wants us to be successful in our flesh. So we can count, you know, we can count the different, uh, you know, I think for me it's interesting. I love to read, the, not about the Pharisees, I love to read what the Pharisees says in the scriptures. It's so interesting, always. You know, like, and, and I love to see what Jesus says about them. You know, I, you heard, maybe you heard this many times, but you've heard me say it because I say it a lot, but when Jesus describes the Pharisees, there's one way for me that summarize the issue of legalism very simply. He describes them as wild sepulcher, white tombs. And and they got it, everybody got it at the time, but for us it might like, oh, what does it mean? Like, does the color, it, he's not talking about the color, he, he talks about the cleanliness on the outside. I don't know if you visited uh, uh, cemeteries, we don't do that a lot. You know, people think if you do that a lot, it's kind of, oh, you're a little bit on the edge. If, yeah, I go there every day, oh, I don't know. <laughs> but the point is, if you have, if you go to visit you know, a tomb of a family member or anything, you see the difference between those who have family members who cares, and the, those who have family members or who don't care, or those who don't have family members anymore. The difference is, when it's clean, there's no, there's no moth on it, there's nothing, and has flowers, really nicely clean, the other one is abandoned. Now you might say, well, this is a nice, this is a nice tombstone, look at this one, you can look, everybody can stop, you can even, you know, like almost we could, you know, look at that, this is really nice. But the point of a tombstone is that if you, if you open both, they have the same, decaying body inside. So the nice tombstone is a trick. So the point that Jesus is saying, you, you look really nice on the outside. Like that, that strange teaching doesn't sound, or doesn't look that, that strange to most people because you look really cool, really nice on the outside. But on the inside, you stink. You really stink. So the guy over there stinks. We know that because look at the outside, it stinks. But the guy looks nice over here because is really nicely neat on the outside, but it stings in the inside as well. So that's what legalism is. Like we're interested on the outside. The Pharisees are very much interested in how you look. 
the, the Sadducees, you might say, they're interested in how you think. But Jesus is interested in how you think and how it affects how you look. That's the, that's the beauty of the transformation that we have. Like, God is not interested in the renewing, renewing of the mind in verse 2 of chapter 12 of Romans just for the sake of being renewed in the mind. He wants us to be renewed in the mind because by this we'll be transformed to glory really to the resemblance of Christ. So if, I, if my mind is renewed, then my walk is different. So God is interested in both, but he's not interested just on the outside or just some kind of, a, you know, a change, a shallow change on the inside either. He wants a deep change in our lives that will come out as a deep change on the outside as well. So my walk with God is reflected. That's the whole book, the whole point of the book of James, right? That, that after you're saved, by grace alone, you enter into works. As Paul said in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10, you enter the works that he has prepared for us. So we do things. Our life change. We walk differently because we think differently. But we do walk differently. So the, the catch, legalism, is, a, is an easy fix. You know, like, you know, here in America, you have duct tape. You know, duct tape can fix everything. It's just like legalism. It, it, you know, it, you, you have a, a bumper that doesn't really hold. You put duct tape on it. That's legalism. God wants a different mindset. He wants a different change. He wants to, 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 he wants to rebuild the, the bumper. He wants to go the deep, not just the duct tape on it. Um, so this is what it says in Ephesians 4.14, right? There is just, there's a plan. It's not just like we are, like we may be or may not be victims of those trans teachings. We may be, and we see that. And if the Bible is correct, and we know it is, when it speaks about the falling out at the end times, it speaks about us. The apostasy is the, is the fake Christians. The falling out is the real Christians who buy the lie. Um, so that's so interesting. Uh, Romans 16. Romans 16, verse 17 and 18. Romans chapter 16, verse 17 and 18. Now I urge you, brethren, not those who cause division and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which you learned, and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ by their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. And there you have the simple again. You remember, if I'm simple, you remember those words Pastor Shalas spoke yesterday about the profile of the Christian. Simple, you remember this? Because I think they're important. Good conscience, humble. So if, I'm, if I have a good conscience, I'm simple, I'm humble, I should be protected. But he's saying, no, the simple may be targeted. Because if I don't get fresh in my walk with God, if I don't have something for today, then my simplicity of yesterday is meaningless. Right? I need to be simple today. I need to be humble today. I need to have a good conscience today. Not about, oh, you know, I got this. I, was, I faced, 10 years ago, I faced the legalist. I was not tempted. And you're not going to be tempted today. You know that for a fact. No, the simple, you know, this is what it says here. Of course, the simplicity of the word could mean several things. It's going to be simple, simple-minded in that sense. But we are simple. That's what we are supposed to, to be as Christians. And then we read that in 2 Corinthians 11. So if you want to look at there with me, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3 and 4. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3 and 4. <clears throat> but I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness. We have this word again, the craftiness. It's not innocent. You know, it's just like, okay, you know, it's not a heresy in passing because I didn't know what to do, so I just came up with a strange idea. There is, there is a thinking behind it. There is intelligence, the craftiness. By his craftiness, so your minds may, may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. We have this word again, simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus from whom we have preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well, up, well uh, put up with it. There are three things here that are different. Almost those categories of heresies that we find. There are three things that Paul finds challenging in this world today. And when you think about these, these are the core of, of our life as a Christian, our theology, of course, but also our, our, our life as we, as we obey it. We have another Jesus 
That's a, that's a different gospel. That's the one that Paul speaks about in, in Galatians. You have a different gospel. You have a different Jesus. You know, it's a, it's, it's, um, so it's not the pure preaching of the cross that we spoke about yesterday in 1 Corinthians one eighteen. It's not the pure gospel based on the grace of God that we, as we read you know, in, in the book of Romans. It is the corruptible. Paul says it is another gospel. And he says not that there is another one that, w- that would be, you know, this is not what he's trying to say. He says it's different, but it's presented as such. So we have a different Jesus, not the one we preach to you, but another one. And we see that happening, you know, because people might say today, like, well, okay, yeah, of course, but Jesus, Jesus is his love. I mean, he, Jesus is love. We, we know that. But it's, it's becoming like, yeah, maybe Jesus is mainly love and then only love. So if Jesus is only love, they, they cannot be a hell. They can't be a hell. It's not possible. Then you're tempted by universalism. Maybe everybody will get saved. I know my God. He's a gracious God. And then, then I'm shrinking Jesus into a word, which is not the word that the Bible used for it. And then it's another Jesus. I'm very tempted by the idea. I mean, who wants to preach about hell? Yes, we agree. <laughs> but it's in the Bible. What do I do with it? And we go back to what we said yesterday. I could rationalize the idea. Yes, but the word Gehenna in the Bible, and I, you know, you know how people want to, you to change your mind, so I, I get, you know, I talk to a lot of the young people, and they read stuff, and they send it to me, like, come on, like, this is 2,000 years ago, the heresy was the same. What are you talking about? Okay, there's new, this new guy comes up with a book with a new argument that you, you've read 100 times, you know. It's, there's no, <laughs> nothing, nothing new under the sun, but the point is, it's another Jesus. It's another one. And then he says, a different spirit. And now we know what it is. You know, like it's, it's a human spirit. Like I'm trying now to, it could be, and, and we read in, in um, Ephesians 4, or we read also in Hebrews 13, is that there is a spirit out there uh, of heresy. There is, and, and it's the work of the devil, of course. Uh, demons are very interested in our theology. Very interested in what we think. Because what we think to be true, those and would be what we preach, because we think it's true, right? So a different spirit, and also a different gospel that you have not accepted. And that's also what we said about legalism earlier. I mean, there are many places in the Bible where we can, you, you, you have warnings. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew 7, the whole, book, the whole book of Galatians, the pastoral epistles, and we, we, go through, we could go through a lot of places where we have warnings about strange teaching. So I don't want to stay too much on that because I don't think it's that interesting uh, in one way, as I said. But the point being here, if we summarize and the takeout would be a first part, would be very simple, is that <clears throat> the, the teaching is out there, the strange teaching is out there, and I, if I think I'm not a candidate to swallow it, that I may be the first candidate to swallow it because I'm immune to the idea, but I'm not immune to the idea at all. Because the pressure and the craftiness, as we said earlier you know, in Ephesians 4, the craftiness, use the word again, uh, of, of deceitful, deceitful plotting, I mean, those words are heavy. Every one of them is heavy. If he would have said, by every, new, every wind of doctrine, I would have got the idea. Yes, of course, yeah, there's so many thoughts out there, but no, 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 which, by the trick of movement, so there's a plan there, and then, they are working hard because it's the cunning craftiness. You know, craftiness could be good. You know, a craftsmanship is good, but this is a, this is a cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. There is, there is a real agenda there. And if I think this is not for me, then I may very well be, uh, and we connect that to what we said yesterday, because I don't want to corrupt the world, the word of God. Of course I don't. But in the same time, I am tempted to be relevant in the wrong way and try to address issues. And remember the one point we made yesterday, one of the motivation for this idea of corrupting the world could be that I don't think the Bible is adequate to answer some questions. And actually, you know, it's something that is very common. People say, well, okay, so there is a word that you see on social media a lot. People try to use the word normalize this, normalize that. You know, okay, we want to make it okay. So, and. I get it. I mean, I'm sure this world has plenty of prejudice that we want to uh, fight against. I'm, I'm okay with the idea. I'm not, 
baffled by the idea that there, there is a reason for it. But then there is one thing that bothered me, uh, I read that a month ago, is almost normalize depression. But I said, what, what's the point? I, I understand what you're saying at the beginning was you can normalize, I mean, people have it, you shouldn't stigmatize them. We're okay with that, right? We're okay with the idea. But normalizing it, make it something you don't even interested into helping people anymore. This is who you are. This is your new identity. You are this, you are that, and you're depressed. That's who you are. But then if, it's, if that means normalizing the idea, then, then we're not helping people anymore. So if I tell you, if you feel, you know, if I'm trying to encourage you by showing you that God is with you, he's got promises, he's going to be okay, everything, now I'm not normalizing your depression anymore. I'm actually telling you you shouldn't be the way you are. So we may be in a, in, in, in a sense, well, maybe those encouragement, they are great for people who feel good. Like a promise is when you feel okay, is another a blessing on top of it. But if you feel depressed, if I'm trying to tell you God is with you, I'm trying to show you that maybe depression is not all there is. But by doing this, I'm not normalizing your depression. Therefore, my, the word, an encouragement of the Bible is not adequate for you anymore. So I shouldn't say that. I don't want to offend you by telling you God can be encouraging to you if you're depressed. Because if I'm encouraging you out of your depression, I'm actually offending you. And I feel completely out of, and so what do I do? I spoke about, you know, the value of death, maybe, you know, you know, you know I don't know what, what, what is left to say. So that's the idea, what I'm thinking, is that the more and more we normalize things by being, by being in one way, we actually are defining ourselves. And we are, so we have to be careful, yes, the world has become a lot more sensitive than before, so I don't think we need to change our message. We don't, but we have to be careful how we deliver it, of course. Yeah, you know, like, it's every generation is different. You know, if you study the history of ideas, you realize that every generation has its own set of presuppositions. You know what a presupposition is, right? It's a set of ideas that you have that, that actually serve as a reading frame for everything you see. Like, if you don't believe there is a God, you won't believe in miracles. Simple, because they cannot be possible, which is completely logical. If there is no God, there cannot be any miracles. It's the same, so it's the presupposition that, so until the, the, um, the Enlightenment century, until I want to say the 1930s and 40s, and then it really changed with World War II, we were at what we call the modern era, where rationalism was the key. Rationalism was the idea, right? We defied reason, and then we have all these new philosophies, empiricism you know, uh, in England and, and uh, rationalism in France, you have all these philosophers, and then the 20th century killed the idea of rationalism because how brutal the 20th century was. World War I, World War II, all kinds of wars, 120 million people died out of rationalism, ideas that were strong and dogmatic. So now we are in post-modernism. Like we, we, it's all about the feelings, it's all about the experience. So, of course, we could say, well, you know, modernism was better for us. Who cares? If the experience is key, then my testimony becomes relevant. That's it. So I can preach to you the gospel and tell you how it worked for me. So I can change the packaging. I don't change the, the message itself. But the temptation would be that, yeah, it's true. Like if I'm dogmatic about things, I'm going to be rejected. You can be dogmatic with your experience as a proof. People respect that because it's your life. And obviously, they're trapped in their own way by saying, what is good for you is not necessarily good for me. Actually, it's good for you anyway. So maybe I will listen. See? So we've got to be aware of that. Um, and before we go to the, um, no, let's go to it now. I think it's, um, so yesterday, so how do we keep ourselves? Like as, as Christians, as leaders, how do we keep ourselves? So we have the answer right there, but we said yesterday when Pastor Schaller brought up some questions, we, the answer was how do we keep ourselves from corrupting the world? It's the same here, it's the same idea. It's, we have those two words we said yesterday. You remember what they were? humility and accountability, right? And this is what you have in the context of Hebrews 13. That's why we read verse 7 and verse 8. Look at those here. Remember those who rule over you and have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith you follow considering the outcome of the conduct. There you have humility and accountability there. Um, you know, 
we heard Pastor Stevens years ago, and there was a booklet on that, you know, choose your local assembly. Why is that important? Uh, because that will influence the way we think. Like if I have a church that preaches the gospel, uh, not the other gospel, not the other Jesus with not another spirit, but the pure gospel of grace, then, then I will be rooted in grace. In what it says, you know, here in... Um, it is good, verse, verse 9 of Hebrews 13, for it is good that the heart be established in grace. Um, if I'm established in grace, I'm not tempted by legalism. Or if I'm established in what the Trinity means theologically, I'm not tempted into unitarianism. unitarianism. We, we believe that there is only one person that changes personality, you know, depending on what they need. So there's all, all kinds of things. If I'm established in theology, then I'm not going to be interested in, 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 uh, in those strange teachings. That's why we have a Bible college. We have a Bible college because we want to put the right roots, the right foundations in people's lives. Like we want people to know. Um, so that we have this humility and accountability. We, 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 as we said here, we remember those who rule over you who have spoken the word of God to you, not anybody who rule over you, but those who have spoken the word of God to you. Because we know we may have some people that rule over us, but that was not the word of God. But, but now we, we have that, you know, so remember those. But you remember what we said yesterday about one of the danger of diminishing the word of God was to preach it without living it. Remember that? This is what he says here, like, considering the outcome of their conduct, not just their words, the conduct. Like the way of life, the old English word that you have in King James, conversation, is actually not a conversation. It's actually a way of life. So we see that, and we see that as uh, something that, that is appealing to us. Yes, we look at this. Yes, and now we put things back in context. It says here, um, all right, so we have the warning. Do not be carried about with various uh, entrenched doctrines. Why? Because it is good for us to be established in, in, by grace. Not the foods we saw. The, but then we go back to verse 7 and 8. We remember those who rule over us, those who actually spoken the word of God to you, whose faith we follow. We follow the, their faith. But we also follow the outcome. We see the outcome of their conduct. The, their lives are inspiring. I don't, I'm not interested in a preacher. I'm interested in a man who lives a life with God and preaches. The preaching is the tip of the iceberg. It's not the main ministry. There is something there. And that's something we, we appreciate and we can see. And, and that, that is very encouraging for us and inspiring in our Christian life. But the other thing is also says here is like, because if you think, we know this the verse 8 very well, right? Jesus is the same yesterday. But have you ever noticed how embedded in the context it is? It almost comes out of nowhere. What are you saying? I need to listen to them. I need to be careful with this. What, why is, what is Jesus not changing have to do with anything in here? It's almost like this. Weird verse, why did he put it there? Well, he put it there because if God doesn't change, then his message doesn't change. So the foundation of, of us not being carried away is not making sure that we don't. It's that we listen to the word, we follow the conduct, and we know that Jesus doesn't change. He doesn't change. So why would his word change? You know, why would God, why would Paul be out of context today, as we said yesterday? Why would he? He wrote it, but he was inspired by the Holy Spirit. So if the Holy Spirit is the same, just like Jesus is the same, the Father is the same, yesterday, today, and forever, why would I read Paul differently today to fit in context? Now, if it was, oh, like we haven't understood this word before, now we have a new way of understanding the word because we have more research on it. I get that, but I'm, not, I'm just saying, well, what he said then does not, is not valid today. That would be the temptation that we spoke about yesterday. So, what do we have? Before he tells us not to be carried away, and that's something I love about the Bible. Every time he's going to give us a command, if you read the verse before, you always have the reason why it's possible. I'm going to give you an example in 2 Peter. 2 Peter 1, because I think this one is so interesting to me. I'm sure it gives, I think it's verse 5. 
So you read verse 5. You know, we have this, this uh, famous long paragraph that sounds like a program. You know, this is what you got to do, guys, okay? Uh, for this very reason, giving all diligence, so be diligent, add your faith, virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, self-control, perseverance, perseverance, godliness, godliness, brotherly kindness, brotherly kindness, love. You're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's going to be a lot of work. And then you go back to the verse, and it says in verse, um, verse 2, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and the knowledge of Jesus Christ, as his divine power has given uh, all things that pertain to love and godliness. So before he tells us that we need all this, he's already saying, you got this. I'm going to give you all this, like brotherly kindness, the, the love, the, the, all this. You have them. I will give you everything that pertains to life and godliness. You have it. Now go and be diligent with it. So that's the way the Bible is all the time. It gives us a command, and then it gives us the, 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 the power to do it. You know, why do we don't fall and carry about very, uh, very strange doctrines? Because we remember those who rule over us. We know that Christ doesn't change. And when you go back to Ephesians 4, 14, as we said earlier, right? Uh, we, we're not tossed to and fro. Why? Because we have those gifts in the church. The prophets, the apostles, the evangelists, the pastors and doctors. So because of that, given to the church, then we are not tossed to and fro. So it's the same idea. Like God gave us everything we need. God gave us everything that pertains to life and godliness. We don't need to strive to get things done. We have all the ingredients. We just have to, to walk in it. In Ephesians 4, 11, 12, we said that. And then to conclude, and then we can have some questions and comments. Verse, you know, uh, the idea here is, is the part B of verse 9, Hebrews 13. Like, it is good for us. It is good for the heart to be established in, in by grace. It is good. This is what God wants us. So it's not just, guys, I, this, is, this is stupid, this is smart. It's not about knowledge. Like, it is good for me to walk in grace because I would not have to walk in legalism. It is good for my heart to be established in grace. So the warnings that we find in this book you know, by J.C. Rowell is not just about us being careful and self-conscious. It's about realizing we need God, we need the church, we need the body, we need the Word of God, and then by, by keeping our hearts, we're not tempted by those strange doctrines and we're not cor corrupting the Word. All right? All right, any questions or comments? And if you do, please come over here, grab the microphone, because this is a live stream and you'll be famous. <laughs> if you have a comment, Keep it short enough so we go to the point if you have a questions as well. Leah's gonna be the first to be famous. There, there's a passage that I've had trouble with. Um, I think it's in Corinthians where Paul is uh, correcting the Corinthians about um, who they're hanging around with. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and he says, I'm not saying don't hang around with uh, embezzlers or, or fornicators of this world, but for those who are believers, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not to even eat with such a one. Mm -hmm. um, how do we not, how do we apply that without being legalistic? Mm -hmm. how, do, how do we apply a lot of this stuff about guarding our own hearts without being legalistic yes. in guarding our hearts. Yes. Well, that's a very good question. And I, um, I think it would take the theology of Greek class on 15 weeks to answer the question. Because as I said earlier, and I agree with you, being grace-oriented could be a legalistic endeavor. We said that. And I think it's always, for me, the answer is always, it's based on what Pastor Shibeli said yesterday, but also at the staff meeting. Not the what, the when, the how, the who, uh, all these things, but the why. Why do I do what I do? Like if I don't, like if we, if we are before God and we, we know, we ask before God, what is my motivation? If my motivation not to, to separate myself from those who actually cause division, if my motivation is because I'm better than you, then there you have it. If my motivation is, first, I obey the word of God. Number two, I could be a victim of the same thing they're a victim of. Because I'm humble enough to realize that I may fall myself. 
you know, when Paul and Galatians tell them that they have to be those who are spiritual go to their brothers and actually correct them, he's asking those who are spiritual to do it. Because anybody can correct anybody. I don't have to be spiritual to correct someone. I could be legalistic. I could be in the flesh and correct. That's what the Pharisees did. They, they are very easy for them to point out how people were wrong. So I would say the main thing for me is motivation. What motivates me? When I say something, when I do something, I think we have three lessons in the book of Proverbs. If we summarize about the way we, is what to say, if I should say it, and if I should say it, when should I say it? Simple. What to say, if I should say it, and if I should say it, when should I say it? So that's the, also the idea of the motivation, right? I'm careful. Anybody else comment or questions? Yes, Marianne. Um, is this on? Yes. Just two quick comments. I loved when you said we corrupt the Bible when we don't think it's adequate. Yes. That really, to me, is very piercing. That it all starts with the Bible. It all has everything we really need. Sometimes there's specifics that come up that aren't addressed, but the essence is in the Word if we seek it out. So I, that was very profound for my soul and spirit. And the other one was, and again, it can seem very simple, maybe not so much to someone else, but the enemy of our soul wants you to succeed in the flesh. And I thought that was very good because um, when my husband and I were in the military, we, we always found as officers, it was much harder to reach other officers because they had a lot more natural um, talents and, and finances and abilities and skills, whereas the enlisted had more of a receptivity, I think, because they weren't so self-made. You know, they had a lot more needs and, and, and openness to life is hard and it's messy and I'm having a you know, hard time making ends meet or doing whatever. So I just think that, um, you know, the flesh really is a, a superb strategy of the enemy to, to, to use. And um, thankfully, God breaks through and, and brings everyone down to a point where God's the only answer. There's mm. nothing in the flesh you can do to get out of this mess that you're in. And if you could, you wouldn't be in the mess. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Sister Dominic. Morning, sir. Am I supposed to look at you? or? Oh, you can look at them if you want to be in the camera. I guess. Hello. <laughs> uh, so this is like one of the really big divides. Uh, I think the dividing line in Christianity is understanding position and experience. Mm -hmm. um, how amazing is it? Uh, like, okay, so in, in Ephesians 5, 8, it says, you are children of light. So walk as children of light. Uh, Romans 6, 6, we know that the old man has been crucified. And then Romans 6, 11, so reckon yourself to be dead. It's like, what, what an amazing thing to be reading um, a command, you know, be diligent to do these things. But like you said, just prior to that, you have all these things. So uh, in my position, I, I'm already equipped uh, with everything that I need. And so now when the command comes, um, it's just, it's not like me forcing something. It's just uh, like, Christ in me, the hope of glory, doing his thing, and I'm submitted to God. And uh, what, a, what a freedom, what a relief, you know. Um, I just found that in my own Christian life, before I met Greater Grace, I was always trying to force things and, and somehow produce results, and I was always coming up empty-handed and frustrated and here we are learning about, you know, just uh, the truth of God that really sets us free. So, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, maybe, yes, Pastor Chris? And then we can take a break. If Pastor Shell is here, then we'll, we'll go for the second hour. Okay. Um, the, on the word legalism, if we remember... Uh, legalism in the book of Galatians was anything that was done in the energy of the flesh. 
So when we talk about obedience or when we talk about sacrifice or we talk about ministry or missions or any type of fervency, um, anything that's motivated by the flesh is disqualified. It's disqualified because it, it falls short. The, the, um, Paul said to the Philippians in Philippians chapter 3, you have no confidence in the flesh. And I think the great thing and the challenging thing and the hard thing about the grace message is, is that it's telling us that my, our flesh profits nothing and that we can't bring the flesh to the table. Flesh needs to be crucified. And until that is resolved in our minds that there's nothing to prove, there's no, there's no driving spirit, there's no disqualification that we need to qualify for or any kind of drive and an insecurity in our relationship with God, then at any time that's going to be a deficit motivation, which is called legalism. So you can look at somebody that is extremely fervent, just incredibly that has just great conviction, very, I mean, you look at people like C.T. Studd and people like that that are just, like, kind of out of their minds. And you look at them, and that's not legalism. You could say well, that guy is legalistic. But I think if you look at someone's, like Hudson Taylor, you know, he had a, he had a revelation of the grace of God, and he said that, it says in his, in his story, it says that he laid himself prostrate on the floor and just said, God, Give me some great work that I can do for you for all of the grace that you have given to me. And I think that when, when and, and, and Paul's remedy to the Galatian church was Galatians chapter 5, that, that, you know, that we have a faith that's motivated by love and that the law in Galatians 5 verse 16 is fulfilled in one word, and that is love. And I think, as we heard last night, that when we respond, when we respond to first love, and first love is, is not me endeavoring to love God, and I think that's really in our American culture, this intentional type of thinking that, you know, I'm attempting to love God, but first love is when I'm just responding to the first love towards me. And then when it means, that when, it, when it says love God with your whole heart, um, what that is meaning is, that is just I'm responding to the love of God towards me that's perpetual, and as we heard last night, that is the, that is the purpose of God. So legalism is, is just simply anything that we are doing in the energy of the flesh that's just so dysfunctional anyway. So, we done?
microphone on? Is the microphone? Okay. Now it's on, yeah. Yeah, it's on now, I think. Okay, good morning, everybody. I heard Pastor Siraji's class was very good. Huh? It was very good. So should we continue on that because there's more to say about it? Or what do you think? Should we do that? He said it, it was a, it was all done exhaustive. He exhausted the subject. Um, so how would we do that? And I can do my part too. I think I can squeeze it in there. But how do we do that? Let's see. Because I wasn't here. I was in a, a Zoom meeting, so I missed it. So here I am, the teacher, with nothing. What? what what do we do let's see what okay that would mean um well how about rejoicing for a little bit a few minutes should we do that just kind of let's all stand up and uh and just rejoice for a while whatever way that is for you praise the lord and and uh hug your neighbor and praise god and uh talk for a minute and Say prayers and sh how sh uh, shout and holler and hoop it up. It's amazing. Okay, you may be seated. Uh, I guess me, maybe the, the whole thing that I want to share with you is like that it would trigger some spiritual kind of uh, like quicken or like make me think or stir my heart, you know. That would be fun, wouldn't it? Oh, how will that ever happen? <laughs> okay, so, Lord, we pray. God, bless, encourage us in the subject today. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for last night. Thank you for the week. Thank you for Dominic here, Pastor Dominic, Costa Rica. Awesome, Pastor Chris. Uh, who else is it? Liam here. Uh, April, thank you, Lord. Praise you. Brittany's here from Turkey. Incredible. Pastor Brent, Brandon, and Lucy's vision for Columbia. Oh, God, we commit it all. We thank you, Father, for people coming from different places have needs, we have maybe broken hearts, uh, maybe failure, very deep disappointment or uh, something about my mind or emotions or my, my um, empty, hurting person and draw and, and bless and pour out and heal and do beyond, above and beyond us Lord, you do this work. You do this, God, we pray. Hallelujah. That's what we want, Lord. We pray for that, God. Thank you, Jesus. 
Jesus, you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Um, I have a, I made some notes here this morning. Look at them. Aren't you proud of me? I did it myself. Oh, yeah, this time I did it myself. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so, yeah, Drew, some big, uh, purpose of the class to, th to encourage and establish you. Okay, that's first, and I believe Pastor Siraji did that in his teaching to be very established in, in what God has done for us and to be very confident about it, very sure about it. Like this is one, uh, I could wrote it this way. Um, okay, if this is, uh, um, we could call this truth, wouldn't it be amazing if I, here, here's me, looking at this, that I would know this this way pretty much accurately and not know it like, like this way, right? Is that, is that beyond your capacity? <laughs> Have I gone beyond your capacity? Okay, so, so uh, many Christians believe that in their hearts and in their lives they have truth, they know truth, because this is really Christ, isn't it? Truth is Christ. And we don't like to walk around the world saying, I am wrong, you know, probably you are wrong, probably the church is wrong, probably the whole world is wrong, we don't know anything, right? So that, that's generally not how we, we talk. It's not really how we think. We rather think that I know Christ. I know I have the spirit of truth in me. I believe in him and that I know him and what I know is true. Like that's Ephesians 4.20. We had it a week ago in a Wednesday night meeting. For you have not so learned Christ learning Christ, knowing Christ, right? Is that what you are usually, that's how we think, isn't it? That's how we talk and how we think. We're rooted and grounded in him. But I've got bad news for you. You can leave the class. I'll give you a little window, a few seconds to leave the class if you want to, after I tell you what I'm going to tell you now that you could get shaken, yeah, in the next 30 minutes. All right, so there's the door. <laughs> it might be better to go. It might be better because I, what I'm going to say can shake, rock your world, okay? It can rock your world. So I'll give you a few minutes to you know, talk to your neighbor. You know, what are you going to eat for lunch today for a minute or two? More should go. No. <laughs> All right, so, um, <laughs> all right, so here's a little assignment at your seat. Could you? Could you write down a lot of verses, just write them down in your notebook, that reinforces the idea that actually you here, this is you, you have a, a renewed mind, Romans 12, 2 and 3, 
so that you can prove what is the perfect, good, and acceptable will of God, that you're right on, that you are spirit-filled. How about this one? First uh, John 2, 20, what, 21, 27. We have an anointing of God, and we know all things. This reassures us of the understanding that we do actually know the Lord, right? And we have the spirit of the Lord. We also have the mind of the Lord. If you've been in our ministry for any period of time, then you're very much rooted and grounded in understanding this, okay? So would you do that? What, take and write down verses that reassure you the believer in grace, in the person of God, in the mind of God, and that you walk in truth. Yeah, you no, these are mine. They're not yours. <laughs> yeah, you can maybe come up with fifteen Bible verses, I don't know. Twenty, how many? Pastor Cannon would know all of them. Okay, anybody want to share some verses? You shout them out. What is it? Okay, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. Pastor Fred. Second Timothy one twelve and thirteen. John ten twenty seven, John ten twenty seven. Second uh, Timothy three. Uh, we we have uh, Paul. Uh, here's another little sketch. That, that uh, there's some junk on there. That brown. I don't know what that is. It's wax. It's just potato. <laughs> uh, uh, so, um, is this one here? Here's another one. Here is uh, Apostle Paul. Let's call this a. An, this is another. This is a person, Paul. And what do you know about Paul? You could. You could also misunderstand the Apostle Paul, right? So the believer could misunderstand God, and he could also misunderstand the person. It happened with Christ, right? Like uh, two ways. Judas Iscariot never really knew Christ. Number two... Um, one of the disciples said, show us the Father. And Jesus said, you, how long must I be with you? you don't, don't you know if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. So there is the potential for blindness 
Yeah, well, there is blindness, 2 Corinthians 3. There's blindness with the Jews. Blindness with the unbeliever is 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. And blindness with a believer, that a believer may not understand or get it. Why do I bring it up? Because it's the point of the class. It's from, not this part isn't in the book, but in your book called The Fallibility of Ministers, chapter 6, page 73. Uh, so this is what rocks your world and mine, you know. The, the, the failure of people, uh, the failure of ministers, uh, people getting it wrong. Uh, people getting, actually, you got a couple points. You've got, number one, uh, uh, God could be misunderstood. Number two, doctrine can be misunderstood. And number three, people can be misunderstood. Great. Oh, no. Oh, no. Now I'm in a lot of trouble. My whole world can go mess and get messed up, right? All right, so this is the end of the class. Thank you for coming. It was awesome. Bye-bye. There's a fast boat to China waiting out there. Okay. Okay, so what do we do about this? Where is it? Where is it written? And where did it happen? And who did it happen to? But it was Galatians chapter two. The apostle Peter was wrong. So turn there with me. Peter was wrong. So Galatians two verse. <clears throat> Uh, verse 4. Titus was circumcised, right? He was compelled to be circumcised, verse 3, in that because of false brethren unaware brought in who came in privily to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus that they might bring us into bondage to whom we gave place by subjection no not for an hour that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. So, um, <clears throat> verse uh, five, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But of these who seem to be somewhat whatsoever they were, it makes no matter to me. I like that. Isn't that interesting? See, these seem to be somewhat. It means <clears throat> they seem to be important dignitaries. They were uh, leaders. They were the important rabbis. They were uh, important people. Might have even been other apostle. Well, we know it. One one of them is Peter. They, uh, uh, verse seven. The contrary wise, when they saw the gospel, the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel, the circumcision was was unto Peter. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty to me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. <clears throat> So Peter is going to be corrected by, was corrected by Paul, and he was to be blamed. There's a couple points here. What did Peter get wrong 
but this this point here doctrine and i'm just using the box idea as here's the doctrine of justification and peter doesn't get it exactly right this is justification without works without circumcision without good works without eating right food dietary laws of the jews and so on peter uh, bends or he gives in, he caves under the pressure of other people and he doesn't have a solid doctrinal way of thinking about justification by faith. So P Paul blamed him. So we have a couple points here. Number one, the error, my, my pen is getting weaker. Here's a here's a box, Pastor. Looks like, yeah, looks good. A whole box of new ones. Oh, oh. Yeah, is this good or is the iPad better? Huh? This is okay. It's easier for me, or at least I. Okay. Uh, number one, the error. The error of a man of God. Okay, doctrinal error, the error of a man of God. It's scary, isn't it? You know, how do I, how can I embrace an error uh, and um, what happened? Number two, Paul blamed him, like Paul will put here, blamed, held him accountable. That does, that, that fit. This, this is a question, this is a discussion, and this one, too, for holding somebody accountable. Because, to be honest, I'm not so eager to look for controversy. I'm not so eager walking around correcting people. It's not always obvious to me that they are wrong. If they are wrong, then, like Pastor Philippe said, you know, what will I say? How do I say it? You know, when do I say it? Who do I say it to? But here, it's in public. This confrontation that Paul has with Peter is in public. Isn't that cool? Do you know what this means? It means that, that uh, you know, having peaceful relations isn't our target. You know, peace is not our target. What is our target? Truth, accountability, holding each other accountable, love, correction. In, in, uh, let's do a, a correction. Correction is a way of life, Proverbs 6, 22 and 23, 23. Correction is important. Has anybody been corrected around here lately? <laughs> but any of you husbands been corrected? Huh? Jeff, you want to explain that to us later? <laughs> okay, so correction. I mean, a lot of times you get to a place in life and Nobody is correcting you like you're above it almost, you know. It happens in leadership like nobody d dares or they don't, they, don't, they don't see it or, I mean, it happens. Leaders can get away with it and they're not being corrected. They don't surround them so they don't invite it. They are not saying in their, in their interaction with people like, I need help. Let's do a little practice on that right now. Just turn to your neighbor and say, I need help. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <clears throat> um. Okay, the third thing, uh, see, the error, uh, 
the believer is also I you all we all say like actually in principle I'm not sure I'm not I can be wrong I'm not but on the other hand as I said about the list of verses you are right you have the Spirit of God it is important your mind is renewed you are spirit filled you are wise you are humble you are discerning and that that this is part of the ministry part of the ministry is recognizing that men of god and women of god are fallible you usually we say what infallible in my household i teach them that <laughs> The infallibility of dad. Okay, so now uh, we are fallible. Uh, make a make a list on the on the side of your paper of all the people in the Bible that you can think of that failed. And guess who we start with? <laughs> Adam. Uh, everybody, everybody did, except maybe we don't read about it with Joseph or Daniel, but I mean, everybody, David, Solomon, uh, Noah, Phineas and Hopney. Oh, I think another one was the prophet Samuel. I don't think we read of a sin in his life, but usually many, yeah, Pastor Steve, they did sin, yeah. Oh, oh, Pastor Steve is making a good point. Samuel failed <laughs> by not raising good boys. Ooh, oh. By the way, in Jesus' genealogy in Matthew, there were four kings in that genealogy that, ra that well, their fathers were godly and the sons were wicked. So a godly man, there's no guarantee a godly man will have a godly son. Is that clear? Yes. Pastor Steve, would you put that in your pipe and smoke it? <laughs> well, <laughs> Samuel's not responsible for his wicked sons. Or maybe, I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, okay. So, uh, I mean, it's a sad thing when our children turn away, and and it's sad. I the, we can't even talk about it. It's terrible, and people suffer with that. But we want to encourage. Uh, us too in the fact that well God will make it clear to us in the future you know what is he doing and we we what can we do we just go on and um, do what we can in the Lord yeah it's great okay so back to my drawing did I tell you that I did this yeah. by myself yeah. off the internet <laughs> 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 no. <laughs> okay. So. Okay. Where Where are we? What What are we doing? Okay. All right. Here it is. Uh, back to Galatians two. Peter has been held accountable by the Apostle Paul. It took uh, Paul the courage, and it's not easy, but he did it in public. Uh, because it was a doctrinal issue. By the way, it was not a personal sin that Peter has. It's not a personal sin that's a private matter. It's a doctrinal issue, you know, of justification by faith. When that doctrine is, uh, is they depart from that doctrine, that's a serious thing that, that needs a public confrontation. Yeah, Pastor Brent. Oh, 
Okay. Oh. Uh, I think uh, the Apostle Paul didn't read Matthew 18. No, <laughs> he wasn't in that class. No, it, no, no, seriously, sorry. I am a, I'm a little silly today. I mean, just how I survive. I've got to goof around. <laughs> what? What? Yeah, I mean, Brent, Pastor Brent's point is, like, when I correct my brother, I go to him alone. But because this is not a, you know, a personal fault or failure when P with Peter, that has just private effects. This is a public thing that I think also Paul wanted everybody in the room to realize that, that this thing is critical that you cannot compromise with the Jews in regards to this, that the Jews have to be understand that this is a glorious gospel and that it has nothing to do with dietary law, like food you eat, nor circumcision. And so Paul did it because it was for the sake of the gospel teaching. Now you might say, let's say, we're, we're in a room with somebody who has a different doctrinal position. I don't know, like they have a different approach or philosophy of ministry. And I, my general attitude is that I'm not their judge. I'm not living with them. I'm not dealing with Joel Olstein or, or some other teacher or pastor, you know. I don't say his name. I'm not involved in his ministry. And there's so many different ones that I could become you know, somebody who's always talking in those terms. But that's not the scenario here. This is at the beginning of the church. These are apostles, you know, not pastors bickering with each other. This is big stuff is on the table. So, you know, I don't feel that it's my place to do, to be thinking like that. I just want to, you know, so, so that I think is pretty, that I think that's clear, right? You know, so did I did you don't? I just wanted you to talk about it. And you okay. And you did. I did. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Go to chapter two, verse uh, uh, twelve. Is it? Uh, for before that certain came from James, that he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were the circumcision. Pastor Shabelli has said this a number of times, that he felt that Peter, Peter's weakness was his fear of religious people. P Peter was afraid because he had, you could say in a social, so the society breakdown, that he was of an inferior class. He was an uneducated fisherman from Galilee, I mean educated to a degree but not a polished professional. So in the midst of that company, he kind of just, you know, was concerned about how he would, how he would relate to them and trying to please them or maybe kind of modify the gospel somehow so it included the legalistic Jew and then the pagan Gentile who got saved. And Peter is saying it's like for everybody but when we're with them, we'll do it this way. When we're with them, we can do it this way. And Paul read into that, said, no, the gospel is, 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 um, is being, the liability is that we will lose the gospel. The gospel can't be lost. And it has nothing to do with these religious people controlling um, this whole thing. They are not in charge. There is something, there is God is in charge. Christ did this for Jew and Gentile, and this is how we're going to live. We're going to grow in grace. We're going to walk with God, and we're going to be, you know, on target. This is his, this is why he's so important in the teaching of the epistles and his way of thinking. So from this, we get this, um, uh, Little, little outline here that he saw the error, 
the weight of it, he encountered it, and um, um, were, was there a third thing? <clears throat> you see. I think it was just that the, the it, it was uh, clarified. It, I don't want to. I've already spent a. I'm uh, spent a lot of time on this point, but I want to move on and finish up here. But um, I think I have a yeah. Okay, the first le lesson here it is. It's on page seventy four. The first lesson is great ministers may make great mistakes. Okay, so uh, we have a doctrinal one, we have a moral mistakes, we have uh, leadership mistakes, history is filled. Number two, that to keep the truth of Christ in his church is even more important than keeping peace. So. Paul was able to blame Peter and go to war over it. Number three, that there is no doctrine about which we ought to be so protective as justification by faith without the deeds of the law. So he's saying that, that the fight was really of very great consequences. All right, so let me give you a couple of names here. With regards to people, let's say, here's a man of God, a great man of God, and um, um, he does a very good job, but then why do people have a lot of confidence in the man? Let's say, here's a man, let's put down, let's put down um, a name, uh, how about John Calvin? Okay, John Calvin. Uh, great man of God. Why do they, why is he a great man of God? Well, if you were in his congregation or you heard about him, why would you respect him? And what would you, why is he great? What, give me a short list. He could be a spiritual man. What else? Dedicated. How about his office? Uh, he's filled with the word. Goes under spiritual. How about uh, popular? He has a. He's respected. He's respected. And what else? Uh, honored, respected. Maybe he is famous. Well, popular. He's famous. Rich. Maybe. All these kind of things that put the man in very high regard. How about in the time of Jesus? Why? What, what did they say? What did the apostles say that gave him high regard and high esteem before other people? Have not I seen the Lord Jesus Christ? 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Can't we go about leading a sister? And aren't we able to be paid for our work? Though Paul said, I don't want to be paid because I don't want it to be misunderstood that I'm doing this work for money. So don't pay me. But I want you to know that I am worthy of the pay. But don't pay me so I won't be misunderstood. In any way, I want to just make a big list here of how other people here, let's say this per you or me, can look at this person and have very high regard for them. Where, where does that lead when, they, when people have high regard for other people? What's that? They, they put them, but okay. They put them on a pedestal. They may not approach them regarding error. Um, they may not be approachable. They don't know how to be there. And so 
the, these people should have a circle, right, of other people that, are, that, that can be with them. That's what Billy Graham did, right? And, and wasn't Jesus in the midst of his disciples? And wasn't he, you know, he, he was with them. He loved them. Of course, he was without sin. He's in a totally different category. But the point is, he is an example. What about a leader highly esteemed, but he's unapproachable? Okay, like not a good model. Where was uh, in Galatians 2 when Peter was corrected? He was also in the midst of others. And Paul came and Paul was there. So that's a good model. Why is this important? Really, all men fail, right? All men are fallible. They may fail, they do fail, and they fail in different ways. What if I'm a Christian and I put too much uh, on this leader? What happens then? I, this leader is so important to me and he's so awesome, but what happens then when, it, when he fails or he falls? I mean, what happens? It happened with a king. This is Second Chronicles uh, 24. Um, and his father, remember, he was, uh, say, turn there with me, Joash, Second Chronicles. Yeah, 24, verse 1 and 2. Joash did what was right in the sight of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada the priest. One and two. How old was Joash? Was he seven years old? And, and who was his leader? His a guardian. Was, was a priest who was of God. Do you know what happened in the story? You, you, does anybody know? Okay, Pastor Matt, what happened? Yes, very good. When this boy... He has a guardian, the priest, who's leading him in the fear of God. And, they, and he does very well as a king up through a number of years. I don't know if it's 15 or 20 years. Then when Jehoiada dies, this, this king goes evil. This boy who's now an adult, he turns evil. His religion was somehow connected with that person. And when that person was alive, but then when he died, he's the, he's the one that ordered the prophet to be stoned between the temple, the altar and the temple. In the story, you can read it. Uh, so when Dr. Stevens dies, what happens? For some people, it's over. It's over. It's like, what? How can that be? What happened to you? Are you a believer in Christ? Are you walking with God? What could that be, you know? How could that happen? That can't happen. That's why I'm saying, that's why we're here today, to talk about it. Even though we may know this, it still, it still can be very upsetting and very discouraging and, and painful because of love at the same time these little little boxes that we're drawing are like this guy John Calvin could be an awesome guy, but it could be that I have a misunderstanding about him. And that he is a mortal man that can make mistakes, and he's not my savior. Christ is. He's not the one that fills me with the Holy Spirit. Christ does. He's not the Bible. He knows the Bible, but he's not the end game. That person is too important for me. So I need to get adjusted to it. 
I need to be in these verses that we drew, wrote down, the, these confident building up verses, so that I would have the right perspective in regards to God, the doctrine, and people. Okay? That's it. Amen. Go away. No, I mean, I love you. I said the wrong word. No, uh, what do we do? Praise the Lord. God bless you. Have a good day.